Hello, everyone, and welcome to our today's Quanser user webinar. We invited Dr. Farouk Atarzar from the New York University Tandon School of Engineering uh, to talk about the developments in the areas of neurorehabilitation and assistive robotics. My name is Zuzana Fabushawa, and together with my colleague, Arian Pana, we will be your hosts and webinar moderators today. Thank you, Zuzana. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today and I hope you all are doing well. Um, I wanna give you some intro about uh, Dr. Atayser. However, uh, he has been very active in this field for the past years and he doesn't need much of an intro, but uh, uh, just in case, I would like to um, give you some information about uh, his bio. Dr. Atayser uh, is an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering, as well as mechanical and aerospace engineering at New York University or NYU Tandon School of Engineering. He's also with NYU Wireless. Prior to joining NYU, Dr. Atexar was a senior postdoc scientist in the Department of Bioengineering at Imperial College London in UK, sponsored by Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, NSERC of Canada. From February 2017 to August 2018, he served as a Postdoc Research Associate at the Canadian Surgical Technologies and Advanced Robotics Center, known as CSTAR. His many awards include the highly competitive NSERC Postdoc Fellowship, or PDF, in 2018. He was ranked among the top five applicants in Canada for the 2018 NSERC PDF comp competition in the electrical and computer engineering sector. Recently, he received an NSF rapid award to conduct research on the topic of smart wearables for detecting health anomalies using machine intelligence. Dr. Atayser leads the medical robotics and interactive intelligent technologies known as Merit Lab at New York University. I have personally had the pleasure to collaborate with Dr. Atayser on some projects such as uh, the robotics workshop at New York University last year and also equipping his robotics lab with Quanser products. We all at Quanser looking forward to continued collaboration and relationship with Dr. Atayser and uh, it's our pleasure to have him on this webinar today. With all that being said, uh, I want to pass the mic to Dr. Atayser and I hope you all enjoy this presentation. Thank you Ari and thank you uh, Susanna for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, for joining us today here. I would like to also thank Quanser for inviting me and giving this great opportunity and organizing this event. Uh, uh, and again, thanks uh, Ariane and Susanna for the great introduction. Uh, my name is Farouk Hataysa, Assistant Professor at New York University, Electrical and Computer Engineering, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and also NYU Wireless. Um, I lead the lab Medical Robotics and Intel Intelligent Interactive Technologies, Merit Lab at NYU. So today I'm going to talk about intelligent, reliable, and interactive tele-rehabilitation robotics system. Uh, so the two-thirds of my talk will be more about the physical interaction between human and robot, and then the last one-third I talk about how we can fuse human nervous system with robot intelligence with machine intelligence. So uh, uh, before starting the, the, the main part of the talk, I would like to give you some some uh, vision about uh, why I'm personally interested in this field. So as a roboticist, I love robots, right? I'm interested when robots and AI come together, for example, in, machine, in, in surgical robotics. And there has been a lot of amazing technological work in that area. Some of these images, you may have seen it, or some of the videos in the next slide, you, can, you, you may have already seen in, in uh, media. So, uh, So uh, robots that can that can like do amazing stuff, right? Robots that can that can move, that can jump, that can uh, interact with objects around. Uh, robots that can make it possible for surgeon to do very tiny surgery and do high high resolution motions and 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 manipulation. So amazing stuff, lots of interesting work, lots of exciting work, right? So let's see what we've done uh, for. For, for our own people, right? So mobility is a human right, and let's see what we've done for people in need. Uh, so to give you a little bit of background, I want to talk about an ancient technology, sixth century technology, when 
uh, engineer think about how to help people which have, who have uh, disabilities, right? So they come up with a combination of wheel and chair. They call it wheelchair, sixth century. And after centuries of work and lots of uh, innovation and, and engineering uh, improvement, we still have the same technology, right? Yes, we made it foldable, but that's definitely not enough, right? There has been a lot of work, of course. This is a little bit of exaggeration here, but this is just to tell you about uh, the, the current stage when we compare what we have right now as the best assistive technique or device that we give to our patients who have disability compared to when we, what we had many, many years ago, right? Yes, this is not enough, and we all know that. So why we are uh, uh, why we are concerned, and when I say we, I mean researchers who work on robotic rehabilitation. One of the problems is that our society is aging. It's aging so fast. In the United States, by 2035, for the first time in history, we're going to have more seniors than children. Uh, it, it's going to happen in 2047 uh, in the world, and it has already happened in Canada, Canada in 2015. Uh, so we know that... Uh, uh, Society aging increases the incidence rate of age-related problems, such as a stroke, which is the leading cause of disabilities. About 15 million people experience a stroke every year. In the United States, there are more than 6 million stroke survivors, and a stroke costs Canadian economy $3.6 billion per year. So lots of uh, concerns there, right? So a stroke results in upper limb problems and lower limb problems, as listed here. Uh, so how we help patients regain some of the lost sensory motor functionality after stroke is, is rehabilitation, is a therapy. When a therapist, a human therapist, work with one patient, during point-to-point -point motion and object manipulation, sometimes the therapist help the patient, assist the patient. Sometimes the therapist resists the patient to provide more challenging tasks for the patient. And the goal is to stimulate neural activity uh, with the hope of regenerating a new neural pathway for, in, through a process which is called brain plasticity or remodeling with the goal of regaining some of the lost sensory motor functionality. So this is great, it works well. I mean, it, there, there has been a lot of patients who have been recovered to some extent, but there's some constraints, right? One of the main constraints is that it's time consuming it, and it's very expensive for our healthcare system. Uh, rehabilitation is needed for extended period of time. The assessment of these patients are very critical, but it's very subjective. Our healthcare system is under-resourced and by mechanics of a patient limits the choice of therapies. And in an era of like COVID, now the resources are even more limited. So all of these problems put a high pressure on our healthcare system, and that would result in delayed therapy and insufficient therapy. In one of the videos on the bottom right, you might be able to see that two therapists trying to help with one patient just to take one step. And we need, we need to have thousands of steps to regain the lost sensory motor functionality. So how to help the situation? One solution, which has been proposed many years back, was robotic rehabilitation or no rehabilitation robotic systems. Uh, the concept of the technology was, uh, was, was published in 1992 and 1995. A version of the technology was patented at MIT in 1995. The goal is to replace conventional hand over hand therapy to accelerate neural plasticity and to quantify the improvement of the patient. So uh, there are lots of different technologies in the market. You might be able to see some of these videos or images. Uh, different technologies, different robotic rehabilitation technologies. For upper limb, we have robotic system. For lower limb, we have robotic system. We have robotic system in the format of the endpoint, or we have robotic system in the format of an exoskeleton. So different technology to help patients, right? So uh, this is exciting, and uh, because with the use of robotic system, we can significantly improve. The, the therapy and the regime of rehabilitation. So during this one slide that I'm talking right now on, you can see the patient on the right has taken at least 10 steps or tens of steps, but the two therapists on the left are still struggling initiating one cycle of a step, right? So this is just one benefit of robotic system. Of course, it's not only about repetition. Repetition is a big part of it, but also it's about interaction, right? With the use of robotic system, we have like virtual reality environment. We can measure the human neural system, EEG, EMG, and then connect that to the performance of robotic system. We can close the loop. We can make the robotic system compatible with the patient intention. And we know that connecting robotic system or rehabilitation to the intention of the patient is a critical factor for rehabilitation. So that's very important, and that can be delivered using robotic rehabilitation systems. So uh, a, a generic uh, schematic of how robot rehabilitation system would work, usually they have a, there is basically like a haptic device or a robot connected rigidly to the patient's limb, and there is a virtual reality environment telling the patient where to move, when to move, 
And also there is a, a low level controller trying to make sure that the patient robot interaction is safe and high level controller to deliver different force fields. And then we have a resistive force field, we have impedance based assistive force field, and we have power based assistive force field, right? So I can't go through all the details, I just want to give you an overview here. So like advantages of the technology, right? The technology, the robotic technology is powerful, which means that robots are good for different patients with different biomechanics. Robots are computerized, which means that they can log position and force information. So that can be quantitative, that can be used for quantitative and objective the tracking of patient performance and robot can repeat a pre-step rehabilitative task, which is very important in the context of rehabilitation. The efficacy of the technology has been used, has, has been, sorry, has been, um, evaluated in many different clinical studies starting in 1997 and still there are lots of studies going on and like uh, in general there's a lot of uh, excitement around robot rehabilitation system and some official organizations such as american heart associations have endorsed robotic rehabilitation system especially for upper limb therapy and then there are different papers for example the paper published in 2006 um, uh, by, by a group at MIT, you can see that uh, they, they have shown the two, the benefit of robotic system. On the left, you can see the performance of the first patient, a patient before using robotic therapy. The trajectories are not as smooth. There is a shift to the right. The trajectories are, are limited. Different points of the workspace are not covered. After several sessions of robotic therapy, you can see that the trajectories are smoother. They're larger. They're all points on corners of uh, workspace uh, are covered. And that shows the performance and improvement. And then you can find more examples such, such as this one uh, in the literature just to show that robotic rehabilitation systems can help, right? So all great work, lots of excitement, lots of positiveness around the topic of robotic rehabilitation, but there are some constraints and that these are the research questions, right? One of the problem is that with the use of robotic system, now we are bypassing the direct interaction between human and, and, and the, the therapist and the patient. And that's a big concern. Uh, because we know that the interpersonal interaction between human uh, therapists who is trained well to perform proper force field to help the patient uh, regain the task is very critical. And then with the use of robotic system, we bypass that and we replace that human basically by a simple adaptive algorithm, which is not enough, right? And there's a lack of standardization, meaning that there's not just one robotic system or one robotic framework. There are many different types of robotic system, different framework, different mode of operation, and that's another problem. The accessibility to this technology is limited, so not many hospitals are equipped with this robotic system. Most of these robotic systems are not designed to be used in home. It would be great if we could have them in homes. And then the patient-robot interaction, stability and safety, is always a concern. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that later in this talk. So like I said, there are lots of questions around this topic. Uh, as I mentioned, interpersonal interaction, the efficacy, that's another question, is the, the carryover effect. And the question here is that, for example, if the patient gets some benefit, how long that benefit would last? Is, is the benefit generalizable to other tasks? Is the benefit generalizable to other limbs? Is it an adjunct therapy or is it a replacement therapy? How we can tune the parameters of robotic rehabilitation systems? Every single one of these questions are different topics of research and there are lots of papers happening in the literature on these topics. So some people ask me sometimes, like, is it efficient to use robotic rehabilitation system or not, right? in general and the question the answer i have is like difficult if someone asks you is it efficient to drive a car i mean you ask what car right are you talking about the car on the left or are you talking about the car on the right so like i said there are lots of questions to be answered in a paper in a literature review paper we published in 2019 um, in elsevier mechatronics we tried to organize all the questions and existing technology to answer what type of technology is existing out there, what modes of operation are existing out there, what type of AI, what modality, how long in terms of the uh, therapy, and then which limb, which type of VR, so on and so forth. So if you're interested in the topic, I highly suggest you to uh, take a look at that paper and then read more about the topic of robotic rehabilitation, and that can help you to be more familiar with the topic. So. The future or the current existing literature that and research that we are very much interested at Merit Lab in NYU is intelligent, accessible, adaptable, and interactive telerobotic system for neurorehabilitation. So I want to talk about some of the work that we've done during the last many years, and that was in collaboration with different universities uh, and different points of my career. So one of the work that I want to talk about here is a, is a paper we published in Archway Transactions on Robotics. Uh, 
the topic here was network in-home teleoperation, telerobotic rehabilitation system. So basically the concept here is, okay, we want to put the therapist back into the loop and how we can do that by having a second robotic system. So we have two robotic system. One is a rehabilitation robotic system connected to the patient hand and one is a second robotic system connected to the therapist or the hold by the therapist. And then the loop is closed. The interaction loop between the patient and the therapist is closed through this impedance coupling that we generated using our control algorithm that I cannot go through the details and mathematics of it. If you're interested, you're more than welcome to check the paper and be more familiar with the mathematics of that. So the video that you're seeing here is basically using two robotic systems. One of them is Quanster Rehabilitation Robot and the other one is the Quanster HGS Square. Um, so the two robotic systems are placed in one room in the same table, but the information is being sent from one from uh, uh, Alberta to, to Ontario and, and back. So it's like a long distance internet connection. And we wanted to see the feasibility of that system and how and the stability of the closed loop interaction if we have telerobotic system for rehabilitation. But why we're interested in telerobotic rehabilitation? Because we can bring the direct kinesthetic supervision of the therapist into the loop of rehabilitation. We can move from the concept of virtual therapy toward the concept of augmented therapy. So basically we want to combine human-human interaction, and then robotic rehabilitation. And the solution that we proposed was telerobotic rehabilitation. Here you can see the same video, different parts of the video. On the left, you can see a uh, demonstration for assistive mode. And on the right, you can see the demonstration for the resistive mode. Yes, during the assistive therapy, the tasks are smoother, faster, because the therapist is helping. During the resistive therapy, the tasks are more difficult or more challenging. The therapist is trying to challenge the patient in different directions. And this is like the very basic first demonstration that we had, right? To show that this is, it is possible to have that. So why telerobotic rehabilitation? Because we can have the direct interaction between human and therapist. The therapist can feel how the patient is performing and the therapist can tune the generation of the force field based on the perception of the patient's performance. We can amplify the power of the therapist, so then we don't need to, the therapist doesn't need to be physically uh, responsible for rehabilitation. He or she can just provide the overall guidance and supervision over teleoperation. We can quantify not only the performance of the patient, but also the delivered therapy. There is no need for an adaptive algorithm because we have the actual intelligence of the therapist in the loop. And this is one step toward our ultimate goal, which is remote internet-based in-home kinesthetic therapy. And why it's important now, one of the reasons is, so for example, now, you know, because of this COVID problem, many patients who are experiencing stroke now, they, they cannot go back and forth to rehabilitation center, centers, right? So one of the solutions would be telerobotic rehabilitation. But this would be possible if and only if we can have robotic system that can be placed in home, right? So in-home compatible robotic system. And that's another topic of research that we have been working on. Because of time, I cannot go to the details. I can just uh, cite our paper published in ICRA 2019, which is the compact design of a five degree of freedom robotic system, uh, which can be used for uh, upper limb and lower limb rehabilitation. And if you're interested, you can read more details in, in the paper. And the system can, it's a very compact, you can put in your backpack. And like I said, it can be used for both upper limb and lower limb. And it's based on a very, it's an innovative uh, mechanism that we've used. And it has an inherent mechanical safety feature to maximize the safety of patient robot interaction. Okay, so now we have our telerobot rehabilitation. What else we can do? So I would like to highlight the, the two work that we've done in 2018 and 19. And that was about uh, using telerobotic system to train robotic system. So what does it mean? Uh, we have telerobotic system. Now the therapist can provide a supervision and examples of rehabilitation. But we don't need to keep the therapist always in the loop for repetition. The therapist can come in the loop, come online, provide some rehabilitative tasks, some rehabilitative examples and guidelines specified for the patient. And then there's an artificial intelligence that can learn that demonstration of the therapy. And then the therapist can go and work with another patient. And then the artificial intelligence can regenerate and generalize that behavior of the therapist for the patient for X amount of repetition until the therapist come back and give another example, right? So here we have the therapist in the loop, but we don't keep the therapist for every single repetition. We keep the therapist for a limited number of repetition to maximize the use of the therapist's time. And this is under the umbrella of learning from demonstration. We did this work based on neural networks and also based on some uh, probabilistic uh, models. Here's an, here is an example, like the, the, the higher the red color, the higher the assistant, the higher the blue color, the higher the resistance. And here you can see 
that and we are visualizing in which part of the workspace the therapist was providing more assistance and more resistance, right? So this is also another way to visualize the system. So jumping to another project, because I wanted to talk about different projects and like the state of the work, the state of the art work that we've been doing on this area is a robotic rehabilitation system for patients who have pathological hand tremor. So uh, this is the work we published initially in 2016, and recently we published the second version of the work in 2020 in Nature Scientific Report. So pathological hand tremor is uh, is like has had these features, right? So it has high amplitude, close frequency range to voluntary component of motion, and high variability. You can imagine if a patient has pathological hand pathological hand tremor, holding a robotic system may not be the best way we want to do because the robotic systems are designed to maximize or amplify the mechanical energy generated by the patient. So you don't want to maximize or amplify the, the involuntary component of motion, right? So you need to treat it differently. So the solution that we proposed was a very simple solution. We said, okay, what if we have a magical motion analyzer that can in real time with minimum time lag, with minimum uh, latency, because the latency is very critical here, uh, decompose the motion of the patient into the voluntary and involuntary component, and then we have a modulated force field, which has one component to promote and to assist the voluntary component of motion, and a second component to oppose and to resist the involuntary component of motion. Fusing the two, we have a modulated force field that can provide assistance for the voluntary component of motion, right? So that's great if we can do that. But then the question is that how you can have that magical motion analyzer with almost zero time delay, because that's a big problem especially for pathological hand tremor because of the features I told you earlier. So we started this work by the concept of band-limited multiple Fourier linear combiner, BMFLC. We had an enhanced version of it, EBMFLC, e and then we add extended Kalman filter. I cannot go through the details of that, but basically what we do, we generate a, a Fourier linear combiner model of the signal in real time, and then we adaptively update the weights of that feature um, to generate the model and then to decompose the signal into the two feature, two components that we want. We tested this work on the data that we collected from 27 patients, 14 Parkinson disease, 13, 13 essential tremor patients, 7 females and 10 females. So uh, uh, then, then the data that we collected was pathological hand tremor of patient, fully upper limb was, uh, was sensorized, and then the result was quite interesting. Again, I cannot go through the details, but uh, you can see an example of the actual tremor versus the extracted tremor on the left. And on the right side of that, you can see the conventional filtering technique. And then you can see that our, tech, our, our filtering technique is nicely tracking the tremor and is able to estimate and extract the tremor. And if you look at the spectrogram, you can also see that the spectrogram is much nicer and smoother. And then there are statistical uh, calculation and evaluation and validation that we've done to prove the efficiency, efficiency of the system. But then the next step was taken in 2020 uh, in collaboration with Concordia University, so that we started thinking about how we can use deep recurrent neural network to make the performance of the motion analyzer even better, right? So we can train deep recurrent neural network to extract the tremor and not only to extract it, but also to predict it at least 10 milliseconds ahead of time. So we want to minimize the delay and we want to go even further than that. We want to model the tremor and use that model to predict what's going to happen next because that's exactly what we want in robotic rehabilitation that helps us to minimize the per maximize the performance and minimize the error in tremor compensation. So the result, the result was quite exciting. Uh, on the left, you can see some examples of the result, and you, the red color is actually the tremor that was extracted using the recurrent neural network. You can see the, 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 the voluntary motion that was extracted with the recurrent neural network, and you can see that the system is nicely tracking the voluntary component of motion with minimum latency. Actually, there is no latency. There is a uh, there, there's a uh, there's a prediction into that, and then you can see the spectrogram, and the spectrogram on the top right, for example, is a comparison, which is much nicer and smoother. The paper was published in Nature Scientific Report, and we're very excited about the work. So then uh, now we have that motion uh, analyzer that extracts the voluntary and involuntary. We can use that to minimize the involuntary and then maximize the energy of voluntary. And here is, is an example of the performance of the system that you can see. Okay, great. So I talk about some of the work that we have done to enhance the performance of robotic rehabilitation system, but there's something that I didn't talk about, and that's about the reliability and agility of this agility of this work. So 
Uh, this is one of the very active areas of research that we have been publishing papers. The latest paper we published was in, uh, in 2020, actually, RGP robotics and automation letters. We published paper in RGP transaction control system um, technology and also international journal of robotic research during the last four or five years. And why we do that? Because we are always concerned about the safety of the patient. So sorry. So I don't know if you heard the audio or you could see the video, but that was just an example of these robotic systems can go unstable, and stability is a big, big, big concern for us. Because why we're concerned? Because these patients are rigidly connected to robotic rehabilitation system, right? They're rigidly connected. They're patients. They cannot be act fast. They cannot, uh, but. Uh, react fast if something goes wrong, they are disabled, they are paralyzed, they are spastic, and then you don't want to make the situation even worse for them. And we, at the same time, we rigidly attach it to robotic system. So what if a robotic rehabilitation system goes unstable, right? That's always a possibility and that's a concern. And we want to work on that to maximize the performance and the stability of the system. Why there's some literature and like some papers suggested that if a robotic rehabilitation system goes unstable, there is a possibility of bone fracture, joint damage, and soft tissue injury, and that could be quite serious. So we want to avoid the, the situation. Uh, so I, I just found this video on YouTube to show you the, the need for high forces. So in this video, um, you can see that a patient is working with a, uh, an industrial robotic system. That robotic system is Mitsubishi PA-10. Uh, when I was in Canada, we had like three of those robots. We keep them in cages. Literally, we keep them in cages. If you open the cage, the robot should shut down because that robot can be quite strong. So this type of interaction can be concerning. And like I said, I found the video on YouTube and that shows the need for high force and agility, but at the same time, concern of the stability and safety. You can see the operator is holding an emergency stop, but I can tell you that the emergency stop is quite slow if a robotic rib, robotic system wants to go unstable. So how we use that robot in those robotic system, not that one industrial, but how we use rehabilitation robotic system in clinic. We limit the force, we limit acceleration, and we limit velocity. We basically kill the performance of this robotic system. We design the fanciest and best mechatronic design of robotic rehabilitation system, but because of concern of safety and stability, we limit the performance, okay? So let's talk a little bit mathematics. I promise not to talk too much mathematics today here, but just give you a little bit of overview about what's gonna happen here. So. One way to establish to, to evaluate the stability of robotic rehabilitation system is through a control theory, nonlinear control theory called passivity. A system is passive when it dissipates energy, and a passive system is stable. And interconnection of a stable subsystems are, are are stable. Okay, so I don't go to to mathematics. So based on mathematical derivation of some basic experiments, we have shown that a resistive therapy is passive, an assistive therapy is non-passive, a power-based assistive therapy is actually very non-passive. Uh, and human therapies can can behave in an unpassive manner because assistance is equal to maximizing energy. Assistance is equal to injecting energy. Assistance is equal to injecting non-passive behavior into the system, right? So that behavior can cause instability because that would violate the passivity condition based on that nonlinear control theory I told you. So there's lots of control techniques in the literature, amazing techniques like time doing passivity control, um, that have been used in the literature to guarantee the stability of a uh, robotic system when it comes to interaction with human and telerobotic systems, especially when there is a delay, right? So the original reason for designing those stabilizers was to, uh, was to combat the delay because we know that delay would result in energy uh, augment, delay is non-passive, results in energy accumulation, and energy uh, accumulation can result in instability. So the the, the conventional techniques observe the energy and modifies the energy if there is a non-passive power packet or, or energy packet, and then to guarantee stability and guarantee, guarantee passivity and guarantee stability, right? So the control technique is there, and let's try that control technique. Here's a, a, a simulation. Uh, you can see in the center, we have the resistive therapy after applying this controller, and it works well. Like the generated force is delivered to the patient, the red color tracking the blue color. But when we go to the assistive therapy, which is the, the last part of it, you can see that the, the reflected force is flat because no force is delivered to the patient, no assistive force is delivered to the patient through the controller. All the non-passive energy is dampened out because the controller assumed that non-passive energy to be something bad, to be something that may result in instability, right? So on the right, you can see the energy curve. And again, like I said, you can see that the energy curve is flattened out, meaning that the patient does not receive any assistive uh, force uh, because through that controller, right? 
So there's a need. There's a need for a controller and stabilizer that can stabilize the system, uh, allowing the non-passive energy to flow, and then minimizing the conservatism of the system because because we want the system to have agility, right? So there was a paper published in uh, 2016 um, by a group in MIT in Archibald Transaction and Neural System and Rehabilitation Engineering by Neville Hogan and his colleagues, and two important items were mentioned in that paper. Uh, guaranteeing passivity results in excessively conservative behavior of the robot, and a less conservative design may be achieved if a quantitative knowledge of human interactive dynamics is available, which is great. So you're also uh, trying so to address that, to, to get to that result, what we propose here uh, is to not only look at force and motion, but also to look at the biomechanics of human. So we wanted to fuse force and motion and biomechanics to guarantee stability, to allow for the non-passive energy to flow, and to minimize the conservatism of the system so that we can have better systems. We have designed three, four different controllers and stabilizers for that. Again, because of time, I cannot go through all of them. But I would like to talk about the last one, which was published in IJRR. Um, very quickly, uh, so the, the control that we proposed was designed based on a strong passivity theory. And a strong passivity theory tells us that if the excess of passivity of the human, I mean, after using a strong, a strong passivity theory, this is the stability condition that we drive. If the excess of passivity of the human biomechanics is larger than the shortage of passivity of the therapy, the system is going to be stable. What is excess of passivity? Excess of passivity is the ability of human biomechanics in absorbing the mechanical energy. We can identify that, and then we can observe the shortage of passivity. We can compare, and then typically we can design a control system that can look at what are the sources that we have, what are the resources that we have in the system, and the resources are excess of passivity of the patient by mechanics, right? So for doing that, we have conducted an experiment. We we ask participants to hold robotic system and we pair tap their hand in different directions, and then we measure force and velocity. We combine them through that nonlinear control theory, and then we calculate excessivity radar plots. So on the top right, you can see the radar plot telling us how much excessivity uh, that participant has in different directions, right? So, but that's not enough because human by mechanics changes by co-contraction. So we also ask the participant to apply grass pressure to increase the co-contraction, and then we tested the system again. And then we tested the system for, again, for a wrist and for the elbow. Uh, so the blue color shows the, the performance, the passivity signature, we call it, for different direction when they're high co-contraction, and the red color shows that that passivity uh, signature when we have low co-contraction. And then you can see that that map significantly changes by adding uh, grass pressure. Right? So in some direction, we have like four times higher capacity now in human biomechanics. So why not use that capacity? And that was the design of the controller. So uh, we tested that for many different participants. I think 20 or 15 participants we tested that. And then here are the energy signature maps that we have developed. So it's very user specific. For some people, it's symmetric. For some people, it's not symmetric. For some people, it's rotated to the right or left. For some people, increasing the co-contraction doesn't change it much. For some people, it does change it significantly. So this is something to pre-identify. And that's the signature of human biomechanics uh, in absorbing the mechanical energy. And if we can. Uh, absorb if we can if we can identify that we can design an amazing controller that can use this knowledge to maximize the performance of the system so recently we tried to also test that system uh, test the concept uh, for human um, hip joint and the paper we published very recently on triple robotic and automation letter the title of the paper is energetic passivity decoding of human uh, hip joint for physical human robot interaction and we have also uh, observed the similar behavior. Again, the pass a very user-specific passivity signature map that changes by incre increasing co-contraction in different angles. And there is a correlation between the angle and the type of co-contraction, like relaxation, flexion, and extension, that you can see in the paper in more details. So let's go to the controller. Can we design a controller? Yes, we did. So uh, we propose a controller that is able to use that knowledge which is the pre-identified signature of the human uh, by mechanics in absorbing mechanical energy and combine that with pressure, for example, or the, the geometry of interaction. And then through a nonlinear controller, you're able to modify the flow of the energy. So I put a valve there basically to just give you, give you the concept of like this controller would modulate the flow of the energy uh, uh, to the system, meaning that, uh, if if the if the you know if there are enough resources, which is the 
which is enough capacity in human body mechanics and absorbing mechanical energy, the controller keeps the valve open. And if during the operation, the patient suddenly relaxes the hand and there is not much damping in the system anymore, then the control would be activated. It's an intelligent controller that can maximize the performance of the system and that work, works very well. And as you can see in the results or in the paper. So that was actually uh, the summary of the, the last slide of my uh, the, the human robot interaction. Before talking about the, 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 the one third of the talk about how we fuse human neural system with machines, I would like to also very quickly talk about, yes, we can use robotic system for rehabilitation, but are there other uses for robotic systems uh, in neural rehabilitation and neuroscience? The answer is yes. With the use of robotic system, we can also study some neurological condition. I want to give you one example of the work that we've done. So that work was published in Artificial Transactions on Haptics, um, and the work was for patients with focal hand dystonia. So in this work, we had the we had the robotic system fully sensorized, and we had we had the upper limb of the patient fully sensorized. We measured the kinematics, we measured the kinesthetic, the amount of forces that the patient applied to the pen, applied to the to the table, and we have done a very extensive clinical test here uh, for patients. Uh, what type of uh, neurological condition we are talking about here is writer's cramp or focal hand dystonia, meaning that those patients can do large motion very well, but when it comes to the very fine control, they get they start having cramp in the muscle, which sometimes is painful, sometimes like tremorous, and that that is not the convenient situation. So before we do that work, there was a lot of literature uh, suggesting that this part problem is just a motor output problem. Part of the brain which is responsible, for example, motor cortex responsible for generating motor output is affected in those patients, resulting in this problem. But we were interested to see by modulating the haptic sensation of those patients during the task, can we get the situation better? So we designed that, I mean, we designed that experimental setup using a robotic system and we modulate their haptic sensation during fine motor task, which was an extensive writing task, and the, the result was really amazing. So on the left, you can see that using robotic system, we are able to enhance the performance of those patients by 58%, and it's statistically significant. So why I say it's very interesting, because those patients also participate in gold standard, one of the existing therapies, which is Boston toxin injection therapy, uh, to relax the muscles a little bit and help those patients. And then through that, of, uh, through that practice, the same group of patients got improved by 40%. When you compare that with the 58%, you can see that the performance of robotics is even much better than one of the therapies. And then when you combine the two, you get improvement by like 65%, which is amazing. So one of the, uh, here you can see the performance of three patients. Um, I just provide that to, to, to tell you that the way that the patient was re responding to that haptic manipulation was very different. So the blue color shows haptics plus that therapy, and then the red color shows the therapy. So um, in, in five sessions, right? So the patient comes to the clinic for five sessions, and then we inject those patients at the end of the first session and the third session. So you can see that, for example, in the bottom right of this image, you can see that the patient in the first session got improved by robotic system uh, 30%, right? Before the injections come into account. After the injection, at the beginning of the second session, you can see that the patient got improved without the robot by 20%, but in the same session, patient using robotic system got improved by almost like 100%. And that shows the combination of haptics and botulinum toxin injection therapies is not a linear combination. And this paper was the first paper, or one of the very first paper, papers proposing that haptic manipulation or haptic sensation has something to do with this, with this situation. So some highlights. Computerized augmented robotic systems have revolutionized the field of neuro rehabilitation and neuroscience. They can be used for rehabilitating human, uh, rehabilitating neurological condition, or studying neurological condition. And one of the ultimate future, which we are very much interested in, is motor homes that are that have a smart in-home telerobotic rehabilitation systems for rehabilitation and assessment. So I would like to quickly talk about the last uh, part, uh, the one third of this uh, this presentation, and that is when we use a robotic system. Uh, with the human nervous system. It's not only about the physical interaction here, it's also about how the intelligence of human and intelligence of the robots are fused. So uh, one of the motivation is for replacement, uh, limb replacement. Unfortunately, there are like more than 185,000 new cases of amputation in the United States every year for many reasons. So we can use robotic system to improve that. But to tell you how that would work out, I can tell you that, uh, uh, 
a healthy limb would have high degree of freedom, voluntary control, and multimodal perception. If someone uh, someone unfortunately loses that limb, uh, that person would lose all of them. So what we can do, we can measure muscle activities like EMG, electromyography, force myography, mechanomyography, different signal modalities. We can fuse and process that to control robotic system, which is great if we could do that. An ideal human machine interface has an intuitive control, is accurate, is agile, has multi degree of freedom, and also has a biofeedback. And that biofeedback is quite important. But the problem is that the current state of many prosthetic limbs are like not not add to the at the intuitive level. We we do mode switching, we do binary classification, on-off control, a slow motion, limited degree of freedom, and basically many existing prosthetic limbs are they don't have biofeedback. So we can improve how by interfacing human and robot not only physically but, but also through the connection of human intelligence and human and, and robot the robotic system. So one of the way of doing that is by processing electromyography, which is the act activity of the muscle signal, which we can process, uh, which we can pick up by uh, sensors that we can put on the muscle through non-invasive uh, sensors, and also with invasive if you insert the needle electrode inside the muscle, and then you can process that information. For example, the paper we published in 2020 uh, using a deep recurrent neural network, we did that, and then to to predict the intention of the patient for doing the task. There has been a lot of work in that regard. This is just one example of the work, and this is one of the work that we've done, but there's a lot of activity and research around this topic, exciting work, and I can talk about the details. But the problem is that most of the time, you cannot get to the fine motor control. It's just like more coarse motions. That's, for example, in this paper we have uh, how we can get to finer motor control. One of the one of the way of doing it is to use high density recording. We have we can have a matrix of many many sensors located closely to to extract a lot of spatial information of the muscle to enhance the performance. So three questions to answer: how to denoise, how to decompose, and how to decode. And I just want to quickly touch these three questions. Uh, by the papers we published in 2020, actually. This is a paper we published on RTP Transactional Neural System Rehabilitation Engineering in 2020, and it's a featured article there. Uh, the question here was how to denoise, because when you have a high density recording, every single one of those sensors actually is like an antenna picking up noise, and then we need to denoise the system, right? So, how to denoise the system here? We focus on the synchrony, because we knew that all those electrodes are measuring a common neural drive coming from the human central nervous system to the human pre, uh, prefrontal nervous system and picked up at the skin, right? So there's a, there should be a synchrony, and then noise and artifact would damage that synchrony in the frequency domain and in the time domain. So we develop a very special adaptive filtering technique, which look at mutual information and coherence to extract the synchrony here and then design an adaptive weighting for every single electrode to maximize the performance. So on the bottom row here, you can see the weighting uh, vector that we have for each single electrode, and you can see that changes over the course of uh, task performance. And with that, we can maximize the performance, and we can actually go from the bottom row to the top row, right? You may say, what is the bottom row, what is the top row? The bottom row is actually the recording of the uh, high-density recording, and the top row is after the proposed filtering. So what you can see in the top row is that by doing that filtering, even visually, you can separate those uh, four degrees of freedom. And that four degrees of freedom are for four fingers. So fine motor control can be achieved if we can nicely denoise the system. So that is checked out. And then we can we evaluate the accuracy, uh, and you can see the performance, which is much better. And then also we evaluate the, the specificity, sensitivity, when we add noise. And then you can see by injecting noise, uh, the performance of the proposed algorithm is quite flat and it's not changing much, but the, without that uh, filter, you can see the performance significantly drops and that shows the uh, significance of the technique that we propose. The next topic I would like to talk quickly is about the decomposition. Now we have the signals, uh, uh, denoise, how we can enhance the performance. So uh, this is the work we, we, uh, we published recently, articulated transactional biomedical engineering in 2020. So one of the things you can do with high density recording is to solve, to, 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 to deconvolve the high density recording to get access to actual activity of single neurons in the spinal cord. Because like I said, every electrode would measure a mixture of activities of neurons. And then if we can decompose that mixture, if we can separate the sources of that mixture, which is the activity of single neurons in the spinal cord, we can significantly improve the performance. But the question is how to decompose it. There has been a huge literature in that area during the last 20 years, I can say, how to decompose. 
and there is lots of exi exciting work in that area. The problem is that most of the existing techniques are, are used to be, are, are uh, not real time. They're offline techniques. The question is that how, can we use recurrent neural network, deep recurrent neural network to decompose that electromyography signal uh, in real time fashion? And that actually was the focus of the work that we published in 2020. And the result was quite amazing. Again, because of time, I cannot go through the details, but I can tell you that if you compare the performance of the field, uh, the, the decomposition technique that we proposed with the gold standard, you can see a lot of agreement and that shows the importance of this work and it's working really well. The very last work of what I would like to talk about is now the decoding, right? So we have this high density uh, measurement, we can decompose it. And what if we use that decompose system instead of basic raw measurement that you can see in this image to, uh, to, de to decode the activation, right? Because what you saw in this image is basically raw measurement and you don't see a repetitive, repetitive pattern when you compare each, uh, when you compare the performance of different subjects, which is different columns. So, we did that, we compared the performance of, of, of decoding using the decomposed EMG compared to the uh, actual um, uh, conventional EMG, and the performance was quite nice. We are able to extract 13 classes for four fingers, meaning that not only each finger, but also if you are activating, ascending, plateau, descending. So we are also able to decompose, to extract and estimate the phases of contraction not only the contraction, but also the phases of contraction with this paper, with this work, which is published in Archipelie Access in 2020. So, and then uh, I, I also talk about feedback and how to get, how we can en enhance the, 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 the biofeedback. And that's, uh, I would like to quickly talk about two work that we published in 2020. And one was to use haptic system for uh, reconstructing a stiffness perception. And one was to, to use haptic system for reconstructing crop perception. So we, did, we generated this wearable haptic system with eight rubber tactile motors, and then uh, we, we provide, uh, we investigate that if people can rely on that haptic system around their limb to, to reconstruct the proprioception, which is lost. And then you can see on the left, when you, uh, when you turn off the vision and people just use their natural instinct, it's, uh, the, the performance is not good, but when you turn on the system that we propose, the participants are able to nicely track the target. Uh, and also we tested that for stiffness perception. If with the haptic sense, haptic uh, modulation, people are able to uh, uh, differentiate between a stiff object or a large and a small object. So uh, both the size of the object and the stiffness of the object. So if there is no limb, how we can use other sensory uh, part of the body to help patients regain some of the lost sensory modality. So lots of work has been done in that area. Like I said, ideal system has a, both put forward and feedback. I quickly talk about some of the work that we've done. This active field of research, there's like tens of groups working on this area. I just talked about the work that we've done in the last year. Lots of new modalities, processing signal, denoising, decomposing, decoding, machine learning algorithm, and how to uh, add perceptual ability to these systems uh, in, in, in terms of invasive and non-invasive technique. The technique I, I showed you here was the non-invasive technique. So, Future is intelligent robots for limb replacement, and that's one of the active areas that we are very much interested at Mary's lab. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. That was the last slide of my talk. I would like to thank the, the sources of funding and all the collaborators. Uh, the name of the the name of them you can find in the in the papers that I presented there. And uh, thank you all for being here today and, and registering for this event. I would like to quickly uh, make an announcement. Uh, we have a we have a special issue about robotics and AI for COVID, which is uh, cross-listed in frontiers in robotics and AI, big data, artificial intelligence, and neuro robotics. And if you're interested in the field, if you're publishing, if you're doing research in the area of uh, COVID-19, focusing on robots and AI, please take a look on my website. You can find more information, and uh, th that could be helpful, hopefully. And thank you all again, and thanks, Quancer, for making this possible, for having this session today. Uh, we are Merit Lab. We are excited on using human and robots for rehabilitation and for re limb replacement. Hopefully, uh, m uh, interesting results and more results will be presented soon. And now I think we can open uh, for any question that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farouk. Thank you very much. Um, it's been amazing as usual. Uh, thanks a lot. Very informative, very nice uh, results and nice work. Thanks a lot again for uh, sharing them. Um, 
so um, a question, Farouk. Um, could, could could you share some um, like examples or real world, I would say, applications or any actual like uh, rehab process that you have done on like actual patients and the results you guys have seen some some recent um, examples maybe? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can I, I, because there was like a, I think I presented about like twenty twenty different works here, so I couldn't go to the details, but yeah. Uh, uh, a couple of ones that you think that would be interesting to share that a patient is suffering from something specific, yeah, I, something I think, that comes to your mind, a couple of examples. Of course. Yeah, sure, sure. I think one of the work that uh, I personally enjoyed a lot doing was the work I mentioned on focal hand dystonia and patients. That was extensive study. That took us like three, four years to finish. That was a really long study that we did. Um, like I said, before us, many people believe that it's just like a motor output problem. But then we were excited to see if there is a haptic component into it, and there was no way to test that without a robotic system. So we use robotic system for um, manipulating the haptic sensation of those patients and see if they can improve by just modulating the the amount of impedance that they feel during interaction with objects. And and the result was quite amazing. And like I said, we uh, we evaluate the performance of we track the performance of patients over many months and like five sessions, the patient go and come back and go and come back. And uh, we evaluate the performance of robotic system. We compare with uh, the therapy, which is actually potassium toxin injection therapy, which is one of the uh, gold standard uh, techniques. And that worked really well. And that was one of the uh, great patient studies that we've conducted. Um, I, I, that, that, that I can say, uh, can I, I mean, if you want more, I can provide more information. Or the other work that I was really interested in was the, about the uh, decomposing. I mean, to understand if we can really extract the voluntary and involuntary components of motion. So we collected, I mean, uh, our clinical collaborator uh, had a huge data set and when we, uh, we were interested to see if deep learning algorithms can help us to decompose that. And then we we're able to do that. So uh, most of the work that we do, so it's a multidisciplinary field. It's a combination of robotics, signal processing, and and uh, testing it on, on human. So um, every single paper has the three components. Of course, being an engineer, I was more focused on the uh, on the engineering aspect part of it, like robotics, signal processing, mathematics, control. But at the same time, I had this exciting interest of the uh, of the neuroscience aspects part of it. So I didn't talk about some of the other work that we've done because that wasn't too much robotic. For example, we evaluate them how I mean it was inspired by robotic system. We know that. Uh, in robotic system, time delay play, plays an important role in, in, in the control. And we wanted to see uh, if we can use the same concept or evaluate the same concept in humans. So we tested patients with Parkinson's disease and we evaluated their perception of time and, uh, and motion. And that was very interesting. It was a paper published in Nature Scientific Report. We have tested patients with Parkinson's disease when they are on medication, off medication, when they're on deep brain stimulation, off deep brain stimulation, and to evaluate how they perceive the like, time, how they perceive motion. And uh, the result was interesting. Like I said, if you check my website, you can see some of those work also. And then we are also trying to do some uh, uh, robotics mediated perception study very soon. So more results will be published soon. Awesome. That's great. That's great. I know and I have seen you working with some well-established, amazing physicians uh, out there, especially in New York. So we cannot wait to see more and more of these uh, amazing results that are coming out of uh, your research. Um, another question is, Farouk, uh, do you work with a uh, parallel robot for rehabilitation? Uh, I mean, parallel robot, we, we have, when we work on mobile robots, not parallel robots. I mean, what, I mean that, that paper I, po I told you, ICRA 2019, there was, that was a mobile platform. And then for controlling part of it, we started thinking about parallel mechanism, but then we go to a friction-based mechanism. Uh, we didn't use parallel mechanism. Uh, I mean, we use uh, we use quantum rehabilitation robot, uh, and also we use the SGS square uh, for some of the work that we do. And uh, I mean, SGS square has a parallel component into it, definitely. So, but apart from that, uh, we didn't uh, use any. Uh, parallel robotic system. Uh, one of the problems in parallel systems is 
is the workspace could be limited. But like I said, uh, we are more interested in, stab in, in controlling robotic system, in signal processing, uh, mechanical design of robotic system wasn't the core for our research so far. We have, like I said, we have designed a robotic system. That was one of the major mechanical design that we've done. But that was not the core for the research. It will be in the future. We have some new ideas and we're working on that. But I, I can't talk, I mean, I cannot say a fully paralyzed, a parallel uh, robotic system that we use. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, just just in case for the people that might not know, uh, HD Square is one of the Quantus products and it stands for High Definition Haptic Device. Uh, if you want to know more information about it, check out Quantus website or reach out to us and uh, we'll help you out. Um, so another question is Farouk from uh, one of the students actually who attended this session. Um, uh, the student is asking, I will be starting as graduate student at NYU Tandon this upcoming semester. Uh, first off, thank you for this informative presentation, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, my question is, how can students get involved with the uh, work that Mary's Lab is doing? So, email me. That's the answer. That's a quick answer. Uh, we, uh, Mary's Lab is growing so fast, and uh, uh, the, the team is growing, although we just started last year at New York University. Uh, but lots of collaboration happening, like I said, at the end of my talk. Um, and, and then before answering that question, I, I don't know if I emphasize on that, but the work that was uh, presented was based on a lot of collaboration. So that was not me only. Lots of collaboration happened. So I like I would like to thank my colleagues. Also. But uh, let's going back to the topic. Uh, if you're interested in working on robotic rehabilitation or medical robotic in general, uh, we do a lot of surgical robotic work and that I didn't present here today. Uh, if you're interested, send me an email, and uh, if you are interested in PhD positions, you can send me an email. If there's opening, we can discuss. If you are a new master's student, you can send me an email and get involved. Uh, students can take master thesis with supervisors, and we can work on projects. Uh, I, there are lots of the students, master and PhD and undergrad at Mary's Lab. So. Uh, if you're interested, just send me an email. I'll be more than happy uh, to continue this conversation. Great. I'm sure it will be a very exciting place for graduate students uh, to work at. Um, so, yeah, please do reach out to Dr. Atay Sarah's email um, address and um, get in touch with them if you are interested. Uh, the last question, based on your presentation, I figured out uh, some obstacle to this research is uh, derived from the issue of generalization of models, policies, and collected knowledge to new cases of or um, new domains. In this regard, in, in this regard, it seems that transfer learning or domain adaption algorithms are possible to provide a solution. Have these algorithms been used for this purpose so far? Yes, I mean that's a great question. Uh, so domain adaptation, transfer learning. If you is, just uh, sorry, Haruki, if you just in case you can um, sort of uh, keep it uh, as short as possible, because another question came up and we we're almost reaching out to the end. Okay. Um, sorry, and thank okay, you. Okay, I, 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 I try to answer in thirty seconds. So domain adaptation, transfer learning has been used for uh, human machine interfacing, especially through ele electromyography (EMG). So uh, you can uh, train a network on a large data set, and then for each participant, you can you can try to transfer that. So that has been used a lot, and also for robot learning and learning from demonstration that has been also used. So domain adaptation and transfer learning is definitely something which has been recently uh, suggested and used for uh, some of the work that I mentioned, including uh, EMG processing. Great. Uh, the last one, what are some advantages of using MMG over EEG? Is any known uh, to be more uh, precise over the other one? Yeah, I think I think the question meant was EMG. So e MMG and EMG, electromyography and mechanomyography. So uh, I have a collaboration with a great colleague in uh, Imperial College Mechanical Engineering Department. We do a lot of work on MMG mechanomyography. I didn't mention that work uh, today because of time restriction. But uh, mechanomyography is basically to measure the mechanical response of the muscle. Electromyography is to measure the electrical response of the muscle. So uh, it's a controversial topic. Some people like one, some people like the other one. We like both. 
I think there is a lot of advantage in electromyography and mechanomyography. One of the benefits of mechanomyography is that it doesn't rely on the electrode steam contact, so it's not electrical impedance, mechanical impedance, basically. So one of the problems with electromyography is that when you put the sensors on the skin and then the patient, would, there's like a sweating or uh, because the, the limb would be in a, in a socket and that results in a humid environment, then the connection between electrode and the skin would could could get loose and then you may lose the impedance or the impedance would change and that changes your signal. So that's one of the problems with electromyography, which can be addressed by mechanomyography because mechanomyography is all based on mechanical connection, not electrical connection. So that's the benefit of mechanomyography. On the other side, electromyography, there's a higher information rate there. So you may get access to higher information through electromyography. But like I said, that's a that's a topic which has been investigated for like a decade now and there are papers suggesting one, there's papers suggesting the other one. We are working on both. And uh, if you track my publication list, you're going to see some new papers which, which are going to uh, be published very soon. And in those papers, we actually compare some of these uh, aspects. But I think that was a quick answer to the question. If you want to continue this conversation, you're more than welcome to send me an email and we can continue the conversation. Awesome. That's great. Uh, that was the end of the questions. If uh, you all have any more questions, reach out to Dr. Atexar through his email address, or he's pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I will pass it to Susanna uh, to wrap up the session. Thanks again, for Susanna. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ari, and thank you, Susanna. Thanks. I, I would like to thank Master also uh, for organizing this. It was a great experience, and I hope that uh, students like the pr presentation, and then uh, they're more than welcome to send me emails. We, we have open positions, so please reach out to me over email, LinkedIn, Twitter, I'll be more than happy to talk about any question you have and any potential for uh, some some project and, and, and collaboration. Uh, thank you, Farox. Thank you, Ariane, for uh, moderating the Q&A session. Um, thanks, everyone who joined us today and looking forward to seeing you online soon. Thank you.